Amen. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. You know, I've been reading 1 Peter. I don't know if you've ever sat down and read this wonderful letter from Peter. But as I've read through this book many times, and I always think sometimes that's good, especially in the New Testament when you are studying a passage of Scripture to really get the context of what the author is saying. So it sometimes helps to read not only one or two verses, but maybe that whole chapter. And then maybe the chapter before it or after it. And maybe if you can, just read the whole book. And as I've been studying First Peter, this one big idea kept popping up in my mind. And it's this idea of hope. First Peter is a message of hope. Amen. You know, where there is no hope, there will be no endeavor. Where there is no hope, people will give up. Where there is no hope, despair and fear and anxiety and despondency will take over you. Having hope is something that is critically important, and it's something that everybody wants to have. Everybody wants to have hope. And you may say, well, what exactly is hope? Well, my feeble attempt at defining hope is hope means that you have a deep confidence that something good and beneficial is going to happen to you in the future. Amen. That's hope. Now, a lot of times we define hope as wishful thinking. Like, today I'm going to go fishing and I hope I will catch a fish. Okay? That's wishful thinking. Or, you know, when people play the lottery, they say, I hope I win the lottery. Well, they're not confident they're going to win it. They've just got wishful thinking that, you know, they wish they would win the lottery. But when the Bible speaks about having hope, Hope means that you have a deep confidence that something good is going to happen to you. Okay, That is what hope is. And that is the type of hope that everybody needs and everybody really wants. Um, as I was thinking about this idea of hope, I did some research. And I found out in the year 2016, this is according uh, to Wikipedia here, Suicide in the United States. Uh, according to the Centers for Disease Control National Center for Health Statistics, in 2016 there were 44,965 reported suicides in the United States. In 2014 there was 42,773. They said on average the annual United States suicide rate increased 24% from 1999 to 2014. It went from 10.5 suicides to 13 suicides per 100,000 people. The highest rate ever recorded in over 28 years. Folks, there's a lot of people in developed countries, in wealthy countries, in well-off countries like the United States that struggle with anxiety and stress and worry and depression. And a lot of that, not all of that, but I believe a lot of that that leads people to depression and suicide is hopelessness. They have no hope. They don't think everything is okay, and they don't think everything is going to be okay. They think it's bad and it's only going to get worse. They think that, oh, my best days are behind me. Nothing good can happen to me. Nothing good's going to happen to me. Uh, everything's falling apart, everything's going to fall apart. That's the way a lot of people think, and it gets them all wrapped up in anxiety and depression. And for many people, sad to say, it leads to suicide. Some of the most wealthiest, most popular, most talented, most good-looking men and women in America have either attempted suicide or have went through and actually committed it and killed themselves. Notable people like Chris Cornell from the band Soundgarden, who I love, <coughs> What was it, two years ago, Dion? At 53 years old, he hung himself. Kurt Cobain, at the age of 27, shot and killed himself with a shotgun. All these people, rich, famous, popular, good-looking, admired by their peers, but yet they were struggling with depression and anxiety and stress. And I think a lot of that stemmed from hopelessness. That is why I think 1 Peter is the message that I need and that you need. And in fact, the United States and everybody in the world needs. Because God, through Peter, brings us a very special message of comfort and hope through this epistle. Amen. Look in verse 1. 
He says, I am Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. See, this letter was written by the apostle Peter. And when you think about Peter, the name Peter means a rock or stone. It's also translated in Aramaic to mean Cephas. Peter was the name that Jesus uh, Jesus gave Simon this name Peter because his name was Simon. Jesus changed his name to Peter, which means stone or rock. And when we think about Peter's life, Peter's life is a perfect, beautiful example of the, of the comfort and the hope that God can give us. Because think about this. Peter's life teaches us this. That God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. Amen. If you think about Peter, Peter was a common man. He was a fisherman, just like his daddy was. He was unlearned, uneducated, according to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Both John and Peter were uneducated men. What did that mean? And I did some research on this. You'll be surprised. It meant that Peter and John and many of the other disciples did not know how to read or write. They were illiterate. You say, well, how did he write First Peter in Greek if he couldn't write? He had somebody do it for him. And if you read the end of chapter 5, you will see the guy's name. It's Silas. Silas transcribed or actually wrote this letter down. Peter was telling him and he wrote it down. Why? Because, probably because Peter couldn't read or write. What level of education would, have Peter, would Peter probably have in today's standards? Probably an elementary education. He was an unlearned, uneducated, blue-collar, lower class, lived basically in poverty. He was a normal, average Joe, just like me and just like you. Yet God chose him, and God worked through him, and God blessed him, and God transformed him, and God used him to do extraordinary, eternal things that changed the course of history. Amen. Now, how does that give us comfort and hope? Because if God can use people like Peter, who was imperfect, not highly talented, not highly educated, not the best looking, not the most charismatic and influential, if he can use people like Peter back then... What is your excuse? Amen. God can use you today. God doesn't look for perfect people. He doesn't look for talented people. He looks for humble people. Amen. Those who humble themselves, God will bless, save, and exalt and use you for His eternal kingdom. Are you listening today? He uses normal people. So many times we think about people in the Bible as these Almost like Superman and Batman and Spider-Man. They had all these magical powers. Peter didn't have nothing when Jesus called him. Peter was a fisherman. And Jesus went to him and he said, Come follow me and I will make you a fisher of men. God does the same thing for us. He calls us and he says, Come follow me and I will use you. To bless and touch lives. And I will use you as my instrument. To bring people from death to eternal life. Amen. That should give us hope and comfort. You know you think about the life of Peter. I can identify with Peter. Because Peter had a big mouth. Isn't, and I have that right mama. I've always had that. I got a smart mouth that gets me in trouble a lot. And it did Peter too. Because a lot of times Peter was the first person to speak up. And see he would say stuff before he would think about it. But he had a good heart, so to speak. His heart was in the right place. You know, many times you think about it, who was the first disciple to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah? It was Peter. Peter said, you are the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. You are the God-man. You are the promised Messiah. But then guess what he said after that? Jesus said, well, yes, you're right, Peter. But I've got to go to Jerusalem, and I'm going to suffer, and I'm going to die on a cross, and I'm going to have to do this in order to get your salvation. And then what did Peter say? No, Lord, you can't go. You're not going to do that. And then so Jesus turned around and rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. <laughs> Peter had many highs and many lows. Think about this. During the Last Supper, Jesus was meeting with his disciples. He had 12 of them. And he said, One of you is going to betray me tonight. And Peter, what did he say? Oh, big mouth Peter. Lord, they might do it. I'm not. I, hey, I, I'm going to go all the way, I, even to death. Now these other ones may, may bow out. Not me. I'm your man. And then Jesus looked at Peter and said, Before the rooster crows three times, you're going to deny me. And what happened? 
Later that night, Jesus was arrested. But as Jesus was getting arrested, what did Peter do? He took his sword out and he cut the guy's ear off. You remember that? <laughs> no, you can't have Jesus. And Jesus said, man, I know you, your heart's in the right place. Put your sword up. This, ain't, this, is, this is the way it's supposed to go down. Let it go down this way. And then later that night, they asked Peter, they said, do you know Jesus? You're one of his disciples. He said, I don't know the man. A few minutes later, somebody else comes up to him and says, hey, I saw you with that Galilean. I saw you with Jesus. You're one of his disciples. I know you. You're Peter. He says, no, 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 no. You got me all wrong. That's not me. I have nothing to do with him. Then the third time, somebody come up to him and said, a little girl maybe, I think, come up to him and said, yeah, I know you. You're Peter. And he swore and he cursed and he put a curse on himself. He said, I swear, and he started cussing, that I don't know Jesus. I don't have nothing to do with him. And then after he said that, Jesus was walking out, already probably with his feet and his hands bound. And he walks out through the courtyard, and the Bible says he looks at Peter. And Peter breaks down crying. See, Peter was an ordinary man just like me and you. Was he perfect? No. Did he sin? Oh, yeah. Did he do a lot of great things? Yeah. Did he do a lot of bad things? Yeah. And that's me and you too. But here's where the hope comes in. God did not give up on Peter even after his sins and his struggles and his mistakes. And God won't give up on you. Amen. And you know what Jesus did after his resurrection? What did Peter do? Peter went back to fishing. Maybe he lost hope. Maybe he felt like, well, I'm too far gone. God doesn't love me no more. Look how much I messed up. I denied him. When he needed me to pray in that garden, I was one of the ones that went to sleep. When he needed me to stand up for him, I was a coward, and, and I cursed him, and I, and I said cuss words, and I swore before God I didn't know him. How could God still love me and use me? Maybe Peter lost hope, and he was back fishing. But what did Jesus do? Jesus did the same thing to Peter that he does to me and you. Jesus went to him. And they were out fishing on the Sea of Galilee, throwing out their nets. And Peter and John and some of the disciples were all hanging out together because they all kind of worked at the same job. And they looked on the bank and, and they heard this guy's voice and he said, Little children, have you caught any fish? He says, Man, we, we worked so hard we ain't caught the first fish. He says, Throw your nets out on that side. And they did. And when they pulled it up, there were so many fish in that net that the net almost burst and it almost capsized the whole doggone boat. And then Peter was the first one to say, hold up, hold up. This has happened before. And he looked. He said, it's got to be the Lord. And he took his, his, his coat off and he jumped in the water and he swam to the bank to be with Jesus. Jesus was there. He started a fire. He cooked some of the fish that they called. He had some bread and they ate together. And after a little while, Jesus looked at Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? And he says, Lord, you know that I love you. You know, there's many times in my life I can identify with Peter in that moment. Can't you? And then he asked, he asked Peter a second time. He said, Peter, he says, do you love me more than these? Was he asking that Peter loved him more than the fish or more than the disciples? I don't really know. But he asked him, he said, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know that I love you. A few minutes later, as they were eating, Jesus looked at him and he said, Peter, do you love me? And he used the word agape. The first two times he used a Greek word called philos, which means brotherly love, like a friend. That third time he said, do you agape me? Do you really trust me and love me? And Peter, I'm sure with tears in his eyes, lifted his head up. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I really love you. And then I'm sure he touched him and he said, now go feed my sheep. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was reinstating Peter. And saying, I know you've made mistakes. I know you've struggled. I know you feel like your best days are behind you. I know you're filled with discouragement. And you feel defeated. But I'm here to tell you, your best day is yet to come. I'm here to tell you, I still love you. And I can still use you. He says, I know I'm right here. And I want you to know I'm for you, my friend. I'm not against you. I know all your sins and struggles, Peter. I know all that you've been through. I know all your highs and lows. I still love you, and I still have a plan and a purpose for your life. Amen. Folks, he says the same thing for us today. He comes to us today, and he says, will you follow me? And the hope is and the comfort is that God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things, just like the Apostle Peter. 
And the second thing I want to say is the last part of that verse where he says, I'm Peter, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. The second way that this, uh, this letter begins to give us comfort and hope is not just through Peter's life and example of how God used him, but it's also through this message because when being an apostle meant that God spoke through Peter in a way that was very special. The apostles were chosen men that had seen Jesus, had seen the resurrected Christ. They were commissioned directly by Jesus Christ. And God the Holy Spirit worked in and through them to guide their ideas and their thoughts and their very words so that we would know the truth and better know God in a personal, real, saving, intimate way. Amen. See, 1 Peter gives us a message of hope because of Peter's life, but secondly because of Peter's message. His message of comfort and hope is not like a Hallmark card that you just hope things are going to get better. But what you read in 1 Peter are the divinely inspired, authoritative, necessary, clear, all-sufficient words of Jesus Christ Himself given to us. I love what the Apostle John says in Revelation 21.5 where Jesus is talking to John and and Jesus is revealing this truth, these truths to him. He says, write down these words. These words are trustworthy and true. See, that's what apostles did. The 12 apostles were, were guided by the Holy Spirit. You know, Peter mentions that. If you go to 2 Peter chapter 1, he says this in verse 20, that none of the Bible, none of Holy Scripture came because of man's own interpretation. But men spoke from God as they were moved along by the Holy Spirit. Amen. These words of comfort and hope are the true, inerrant, infallible words of God to us. So many people say, I want God to speak to me. Read the Bible. I want to hear from God. I want to know God. Read your Bible. I want to be closer to Jesus. Listen to the apostles' teaching. What did the early church do? Acts 2.42 they continued in what? The Apostles' Doctrine. Any preacher that gets up here and preaches any other message than the Apostles' Doctrine is not preaching you the true message from God. Amen. You know, there are a lot of false prophets that will give false hope. Cut on a lot of Christian TV, you'll see it. <laughs> they want to mislead you in order to get your money. In order to get you to buy their book and their Miracle Spring Water and all that other mess they sell. It's a bunch of baloney. But listen, this book of 1 Peter and all 66 books of the Holy Bible are true words from God to you. You can take them to the bank. You can believe them. You can hold on to them no matter how you feel or what's going on or what people say. You can hold on fast to God and His Word. His Word will not return void. His Word can transform lives. His words can bring comfort, joy, and peace to your mind and heart if you will reach out to Him and trust Him and hold fast to His Word. i got to hurry up here. So we can have comfort and hope because of the life of Peter and because of Peter's message. Look at verse 2. I know i got to hurry up here. When I miss a week, I feel like i got to preach twice as long. But I can't do that, so i got to hurry up. He says in verse 2, he says, I'm writing to those who are elect. For the last part of verse 1, I'm writing to those who are the elect exiles who have been scattered in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, however you say those words. All those words right there are basically just regions in modern-day Turkey or in that, or that region of Asia Minor. He's writing to these different Christians and churches who have been scattered around in this different part of Asia Minor. He is writing to them and trying to give them this message of comfort and hope because they really needed comfort and hope just like we do. Think about this. Uh, when 1 Peter was written, it was about A.D. 64. What happened in A.D. 64 was a guy took over the Roman Empire. His name was Nero. Nero was a very wicked ruler. And here's what he did. Uh, m much of the city of Rome, Italy, which was the capital, got burned down in a fire. And here's what Nero did. He blamed the Christians. Because in AD 64, Christianity was only about 30 years old. It was a very new religion. And a lot of people didn't know what to think about these Christians. They thought they were antisocial. They even called Christians atheists. 
because they didn't worship the Greek and Roman gods. <laughs> they thought that Christians were cannibals. You know why they thought we were cannibals? Because we ate the body and blood of Christ. <laughs> Isn't that weird? But they didn't know. So we were cannibals, we were atheists, we were antisocial, and they didn't like us. Many people didn't. Maybe like some of the problems that you and I experience when we go to work or when we're out in the community. This world is getting more and more hostile towards us who are believers. Amen. And it's only going to get worse until Jesus comes back. But Peter knew that this was happening in Rome, Italy, and many of these Christians were scattered or dispersed and left Rome fleeing for their lives. They were afraid and they began to lose hope. And so Paul, uh, Peter is writing this letter to them to give them comfort and hope. You know, the Bible tells us, if you go to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, that if we don't have Jesus Christ, we have no hope in this world. Amen. He says, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise. You had no hope in this world and you were without God. Listen, if we don't have Christ, if we don't have His Word, if, we don't, if we're not trusting in Him, we don't have hope in this world. And so Peter is trying to remind these chosen, true Christians who are being persecuted and who have been scattered all throughout the Roman Empire that they have a reason to have hope. That everything is going to be okay. That the best is yet to come. That good things are coming their way. That everything's going to work out and be okay even if it doesn't seem like it. Peter's trying to remind them and, and bring that message to them because he knows that they were about to need it because the persecution was only going to get worse. Amen. You know, so many people, when they don't have hope, they do get discouraged and they do feel like giving up and they do feel like throwing in the towel. Peter did not want the believers to do that. So look in verse 2, and this is what I'm going to end on today here in this verse. This was the beginning of Peter's message of comfort and hope that would strengthen the Christians back then as well as us today in 2019. This is how we can have comfort and hope. Look at verse 2. We can have comfort and hope because God chose you. God loves you. God sent the Holy Spirit to regenerate and to quicken and to change you. God sent His Son to live, die, and rise again in order to rescue and deliver you. And to take you from death and hell and no hope. To give you peace, hope, joy, purpose, love, and eternal life. If you really ponder that truth in verse 2, if you really think about this, of what Peter is saying, that will give you a great comfort and hope. Amen. You know everything's going to be okay. You know that your future is going to be better than your past. You know that the best, beautiful days are not behind you. They are yet to come. Why? Because God has chosen to give you that as a free gift. He says, we have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God the Father chose us. He foreknew us. Now there lies a controversy. And I know I'm almost done with my time, so I'm sorry. I don't know if I should even get into this, but i got to do it anyway. Foreknowledge. What does that word mean? What does it mean that God foreknew us? Now some, this is a real quick breakdown. You have some that are Arminians, and if you don't know what an Arminian is, don't worry about it. It's no big deal. That's just a group of people that say foreknow meant that God foresaw that Peter was going to trust Jesus, and therefore God chose Peter. Okay? That's basically your Arminians, your Wesleyans, your Methodist, Assembly of God, Church of God, Pentecostals are mostly Arminian. Then you have over here what you call them dreaded Calvinists. These Calvinists over here believe that, you know what, Peter would have never chose Jesus on his own. Peter would have never done anything good. He would have kept doing what Peter wanted to do. And that all changed, not when Peter decided to get spiritual and holy and seek God, but that all changed because God chose Peter. And God pursued Peter. And God changed Peter. And God blessed and loved Peter, even though Peter didn't deserve it. And that's why Peter became a great apostle and messenger of Jesus Christ. It was not because Peter was good and holy and spiritual and worked hard, but it's how good and gracious and kind and merciful God is that he would save and use somebody like Peter. Now, I'm going to be completely up front. When I interpret this verse, I don't necessarily agree with everything Augustine or Calvin or those people said. But when it comes to understanding foreknowledge, I have no choice but to believe it. 
Because if you say what does foreknowledge mean, look at chapter 1, verse 20. It says that Jesus was foreknown before the foundations of the world, but was made manifest in these last days for your sake. What does foreknown mean before the foundations of the world? It means that, that God the Father knew and loved Jesus before the world was created. Amen. Now guess what it means in verse 2? The same thing. The same writer used the same Greek word. The same idea is that before God made this world, He knew you. Amen. And He loved you. And He chose you. And He called you out of this world. And He knew that you had no hope. And you were headed for hell. And you were lost, dead, and blind. And that you had nothing good in you. But God decided He would have mercy on you. Paul says in Romans 9, God says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. None of The only thing all of us deserve is God's wrath in hell because we are sinners. What makes that change? It's not us. It's God. God foreknew us. He knew you and set His special saving love on you before the world was spoke into existence. God knew you. Read it in Ephesians chapter 1. Read it in Revelation chapter 13 where your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundations of the world. <laughs> wow, isn't that great? That should give you comfort and hope that God not only loves you now, but God has always known and loved you. God knows all your warts, all your sins, all your struggles, and that's not stopping Him. He said, you are my chosen child. I love you. I've always loved you, and I always will love you. And because I have loved you and set my love on you, you always have a reason to rejoice and have comfort and hope because I am going to take care of you, and I'm going to let you share in my glory in heaven, and I'm going to work all things out for you if you'll trust me and follow me. I feel like Ric Flair at a wrestling match up here. I just got the devil pinned down, boy. One, two, three. He's dead. Now, a lot of preachers ain't going to say that because they're scared to say Calvinism or Augustinianism or whatever. I don't, I don't care. I'm here to preach Jesus and the Bible. And if Calvin and Augustine and Martin Luther and all those guys got it right, I salute them guys. All the rest of these people that want to change it, read your Bible. Amen. Amen. Now, let's keep going. God the Father elected us. He set His love on us. He chose us. Not that we chose God. He chose us. Let me say one more thing that may get you really worked up here. God has not chosen everybody. That's the part that really makes people mad. Because God has chosen to offer salvation to everybody. God's desire is that all people will be saved. So He offers salvation to everyone. Nobody's going to come. You know why? Because we're all dead in our trespasses and sins. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1. Think about it. Did God choose the Hittites or the Israelites? So that means he didn't choose the Hittites, right? Did he choose the Amorites? No. Who did he choose? The Israelites. What is, isn't that unfair? Why would he choose Abraham and not somebody else? Why did he choose Isaac and Jacob and not Johnny and Sam? Why did he choose Noah and not some other family? See, the Arminian would say because he foresaw that Noah would do this or he foresaw Abraham would do this. But see, listen, this is where you mess up. The reason Noah built the boat was not because Noah was good and holy. It's because God revealed truth to him and changed his heart and then sent him about a mission to build the boat. <laughs> he would have never built the boat. Abraham offered his son Isaac on the altar not because he had some idea one day to do it. It's because God already chose him. God already regenerated and gave him spiritual life and revealed himself to him. And because of that, Abraham did what he did. Okay? So the fact of the matter is God doesn't choose everybody to be saved. In one sense, he does because he loves the world. He wants the world to be saved. But nobody is going to come by their own free will. If you are a Christian... It's not because you are smarter and wiser and better and more holy than anyone else. The only reason you come is because Jesus said, You didn't choose me, I first chose you. Amen. You are dead in your trespasses. Have you ever seen a dead man do anything? No. Well, then why do you think someone who's dead in their sins can do anything? Well, we have free will. Yeah, we do have free will, but that free will is dead in sin. That free will only loves to do sin. I'll give you an analogy. I am never going to pull for Auburn during the Iron Bowl. Garrett, I love you, but I can't do it. You know why I'll never pull for Auburn in the Iron Bowl? Because I'm a diehard Alabama fan. I am dead to Auburn. God bless them, I'm dead to Auburn. 
The only way that changes is if God does a miracle in me and all of a sudden I love orange and blue more than the red and white. Okay? He could do that, but it hasn't happened yet. This is the same way. If you're a sinner, you love to sin. You are dead. You are lost. You are blind. How can a blind man find the door? How can a dead man get up and follow Christ? He can't. Well, then how does, how does that happen? It's because God the Father chooses him, sets his love on him, and then look what he does in verse 2. He sends the Holy Spirit to sanctify or consecrate him. The Father chooses you. The Holy Spirit comes and quickens you. He gives you life. He breathes life into you. He regenerates you. He is what John said in John chapter 3. You become born again. Are you with me? Amen. Born again is when you go from death to life. It's when you, you go from being dead to God to now you love God and know God and want to obey God. Why does that happen? It's not because of something you did. It's something that God did in you. Amen. Now why does He do it that way? So that you can't brag. That's why he does it that way. So you can't boast about anything. Anything you do in your Christian life is not because you are good. It's because God is good. Amen. If you go to heaven, it's because God plucked you out of this world and had mercy on you. If you go to hell, you can't shake your fist at God and say, Oh God, if you would have chosen me, I would have went to heaven. No. God offers you salvation. God wants all of you to come. But if you wind up in hell, it's because you have shaken your fist at God and said, I will not believe the gospel. I will not trust and obey Christ. I will not honor Him. I am going to do what I want to do. And if that means hell, so be it. That's why you wind up in hell. Every man is in hell because of their own sins. Every man or woman is in heaven because of God's grace. Not of works, so that no man may boast. Call me a Calvinist. Call me whatever you want to call me. I just say I'm preaching the gospel. That's all I say I'm preaching is I'm preaching that good old-fashioned gospel that Charles Spurgeon, George Whitfield, John Calvin, Martin Luther, St. Augustine, all those people always did. Arminianism didn't even start until the late 1700s. Why? Because they didn't like the idea of God being on the throne and that God ultimately makes the decisions, not man. Amen. God can do whatever He wants, wherever He wants. He doesn't need you, but He chooses to work in and through you. Okay, i got to hurry up. I know I'm boring y'all to death. Oh, Lord, y'all like, man, you're already preaching 32 minutes. Would you hurry up? But I want you to get this today because, listen, if God has chose you, if God has sent the Holy Spirit to sanctify you or to change you or set you apart, why has He done that? So that you will be obedient to Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. That's what I want to end on. God the Father chooses you. He sends the Holy Spirit to quicken you. So then you realize you're a sinner. You realize there's a God. You realize Jesus is God. You repent and trust Him. That's what happens for obedience to Jesus Christ. Why are you obedient to Jesus Christ and His gospel and His word? Why has His blood cleansed you of all your unrighteousness and has made you holy before God? Why? It's because the Spirit changed you. Why did the Spirit change you and not somebody else? It's because the Father sent the Spirit and He elected you. Just as He did Abraham, just as He did Noah, just as He did Moses, just as He did David. Remember how David became king? Samuel's the prophet. Samuel says, surely it's this guy. God says, no, I picked this guy. <laughs> Are y'all with me? Why did Jesus choose Matthew and not this person? He chose all the disciples and he chooses us as his church. We are his bride. Every husband gets to choose his bride. God got to pick his bride. You're his bride. Amen. That should give you comfort. That if God has loved you and chosen you and sanctified you by the Spirit and he has sent Jesus Christ to live, die, and rise again to purchase your salvation, to cleanse you, to give you a new hope and a new life, and peace and grace and love and blessings, that should give you comfort and hope. Amen. That God's grace and peace will be multiplied to you through Jesus Christ as you trust and follow Him. Amen. Amen. Let me leave you with this quote. I'm going to be quiet. <clears throat> the Heidelberg Catechism that many of the kids are studying, it says this so beautifully, and it summarizes everything I have said about this comfort and hope of 1 Peter. And I hope you get that today. I hope if you're a Christian out there today, I haven't put you to sleep, but I hope you leave here today having some hope in your heart. Amen. That everything's going to be okay. That everything's going to be okay. That your best is yet to come. Why? Because God chose you. God loves you. The Holy Spirit is residing within you. Jesus has purchased your salvation. So glory is waiting on you. And because we have that hope, we purify ourselves. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. And we want to serve Him and honor Him. But let me end with this. Heidelberg Catechism. It says, this was written in 1563. Long, long time ago. What is your only comfort in life and in death? 
Listen, I think this summarizes everything in Peter's greeting. The guy says, this is my comfort, that I, with my body and soul, both in life and in death, I am not my own, but I belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. With His precious blood, He has fully satisfied for all of my sins. And He has redeemed me from the power of the devil. And He now preserves me so that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Yes, that all things must work together for my salvation. Wherefore, by His Holy Spirit, He also assures me of eternal life and he makes me heartily willing and ready henceforth to live for him. Amen. That is the comfort and hope that Peter is going to talk about in this letter. And he kind of starts out with in his introduction today. Amen. Amen. So if you're a Christian today, I want you to have that hope and that comfort in Jesus. And if you're not a Christian today and you don't have that hope and that comfort and you feel hopeless and you feel discouraged and you feel defeated, trust in Christ. You say, Sam, how do I know if God's chosen me? What happens if God hasn't chosen me? Do you want to be a Christian? Do you want to be saved? Do you want to love and follow Jesus? You say, yes, sir. Then you're elect. You know why? Because otherwise you'd never want to. Amen. You wouldn't care. You would be dead. Amen. 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 So God may be drawing you today through His Spirit. He may be quickening you. And if you are a Christian, this is what you need to remember. Because I've had to tell myself, because I've had a lot of tooth pain this past nine months. Right, Dion? Hope I ain't put you to sleep up there. Nine months. <laughs> no. The past nine months I've had so much pain. And I sometimes feel like there is no hope. But if we really believe the scriptures, there is hope that things are going to get better. That one day there will be no more suffering. That one day we'll see Jesus in glory. And all of these trials and tribulations are going to be but just a little blimp on the screen. God's got you in the palm of his hand. He knows you and he loves you and he's going to take care of you. And he saved you through Jesus Christ. And he will not leave you and he'll never forsake you. If that doesn't give you comfort and hope, I need to quit and never come back. Amen. Amen. Let's give the Lord a final <laughs> Woo, That was too long today, y'all. I apologize. <laughs> Woo, I should have known. It's only two verses, but man, just think about that. And I'm a moron. I'm an uneducated man. But I'm going to tell you what a great message of 1 Peter. I hope you get some comfort and hope today from the Lord. So let's pray today and then we'll close out our service. Father.